the Chief of Staff of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rod Joy. Hey, hello everybody. My name is Rod Joy. I serve as the Chief of Staff at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's gathering on tech as art. At a time of enormous consequence for our country, and at a time when we all need what art brings us, the Arts Endowment is pleased to release the report, Tech as Art, supporting artists who use technology as a creative medium. You can read and download the report on our website at arts.gov. There are so many things I appreciate about uh, this field scan and recommendations report. Uh, first and foremost, it helps people more fully understand how artists are incorporating digital technologies into their artistic practice. It also unpacks the creative ecosystem that surrounds this practice, including current and potential sources of support. I would like to thank our phenomenal partners who helped make this field scan and publication possible. We are so, so grateful to the Ford Foundation and the Knight Foundation for joining forces with us on this project. We are pleased to be joined by them today, along with other practitioners, to discuss ways that artists are actively challenging assumptions of technology and building equity and fairness in their communities. Here at the Arts Endowment, we have deepened our commitment to support projects at the intersection of arts and technology through our flagship Grants for Arts Projects program in the media arts discipline. We encourage applications for projects of all sizes from a variety of organizations, large and small, in rural and urban communities alike. Today, in addition to hearing from prominent artists and funders, you'll also be hearing from a dynamic duo of NEA staff members leading up this important work. Chances are, if you're zooming in today, you're familiar with Jax DeLuca, our Director of Media Arts. Uh, Jax is an absolute joy to work with, and she is a force of nature when it comes to supporting artistic practices in film, video, audio, immersive media, and other emergent technologies. At this point, I'm pleased to pass the mic to a key collaborator with Jax at the NEA on this project to talk about why this area of research was of significance to the Arts Endowment, I'm now pleased to introduce the NEA's Director of Research and Analysis, Sunil Iyengar. Sunil, take it away. Thank you very much, Ra. It gives me great pleasure to appear on behalf of the NEA's Office of Research and Analysis at the launch of this report, Tech as Art, which has been a long time in the making. This all began more than three years ago when Jax DeLuca, our visionary director of media arts, you'll hear from Jax in a bit, approached our team and asked how we might get our hands around the growing influx of artwork that is made using technology, where technology is in fact a creative medium. Her enthusiasm was infectious to say the least, but more important, she was able to cite and show specific examples so my team could better understand what she meant. Creative uses of code, computation and data, tool building, by artists, for artists, and of course, virtual and augmented reality. But rather than just take stock of these innovations in the arts, Jax wanted to go a step further to understand and clarify needs and opportunities for workers in this emergent field of practice. She wanted to hear directly from them, in other words. This led to multiple roundtables that were conducted around the country as part of the overall field scan. We are fortunate to engage the group Eight Bridges for this work, thanks to the team there, Sarah Lutman, Jessica Clark, Jessica Fiala, and Patricia Johnson, and the work was guided every step of the way by the NEA Media Arts team and by the NEA's Deputy Director of Research and Analysis, Patricia Moore Schaefer. I want to thank Dr. Schaefer and also Patricia German, who helped at a later stage of the report's development. I should tell you why, apart from the benefit for the NEA's Media Arts Division, this was such a beckoning research topic for our office. One, for decades, we've been tracking and reporting national statistics about artists in the workforce, including their high rates of self-employment and part-time employment and demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. Yet here was a group about whom we, know, we knew very little. We don't routinely track these artists as a unique category. 
This report gave us a chance to explore how they might be similar to and different from other types of artists in terms of background and training. Two, the NEA's research team has done a lot of work around cross-sectoral partnerships in the arts, studies of the arts in health and community development and in manufacturing, for example. Tech-centered artists are often inherently cross-sectoral, not just because they fuse art with technology, but by the spaces they inhabit in science, education, social justice, and many more. Three, the study coincided with an item on our five-year research agenda, where we propose to understand the role of digital media in arts participation more broadly. Recent numbers suggest that web streaming and web publishing are the most rapidly growing segment of the US economy, arts economy, and have been for years, a pattern that likely has continued throughout the pandemic. We saw arts organizations of all budgets, sizes, and fields accelerate their own use of digital and virtual technologies and spaces and now it seemed right to hear from artists who have been innovating in those spaces for years, but who still face many of the same inequities elsewhere in the arts ecosystem, some very specific to digital access and communities that present hurdles for new potential generations of artists, arts learners, and arts participants. Unlike many other NEA research reports, this one comes with evidence-based recommendations for funders and practitioners. This is important, especially as the NEA completes its strategic planning process covering the next four years. Also, I know that Jax and I are incredibly grateful to the Ford Foundation and the Knight Foundation for their support throughout this journey with us. Therefore, it's good to be able to introduce Margaret Morton, Director of the Creativity and Free Expression Team at the Ford Foundation. Margaret? Thank you so much, Sunil, um, and thank you, um, Ra and Jax and my colleagues at the Knight Foundation and all of the artists and consultants involved in making this report possible. Um, we too have actually really looked forward to the results of this report um, since we learned um, that Jax was, um, had really proposed it and, and the Knight Foundation was initially involved. Um, we work at the Ford Foundation and our creative sector across the arts, documentary film, media, and journalism. And um, we knew and know that there, there are um, sort of rising creators who have been working in this space. We also know that in our history um, in the United States, there's been an undercapitalization of um, creators um, and entities that are um, that serve communities of color and um, and we really really welcome this opportunity to at the ground level um, be able to learn together across government and philanthropy um, who who is working at the intersection of this space so that was really important for us from a standpoint of equity um, we also have learned um, through our larger work in the technology space um, that, you know, the digital realm holds an important area for influence um, on everything from civic engagement um, to how we um, assert um, power and, and how, we, how we work together um, on everything from voting um, to asserting our rights and um, it's all the more important um, that we we know that there are creators who really do um, work in the social justice realm who are increasingly working in the digital space and it just holds a place of great influence um, for our work across the world so i thank you for this opportunity and commend everyone on um, the results of this report that really exceeded expectations about what it holds for us, what it's taught us, and what it holds for us. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Coven Smith, Senior Director of Arts at the Knight Foundation. And I'd just like to quickly echo Margaret's comments. Um, you know, across all artistic disciplines, technology we know plays a role in the way our work is produced. 
consumed and distributed. And uh, despite the impact of technology-based projects, we feel that investment in the intersection of arts and technology is an undersized portion of the larger contemporary arts funding landscape. And so the process of producing this report has really helped us to better understand that landscape and to more accurately identify where the opportunities may lie. And so with that, I just do wanna say, add to the, the chorus of praise for Jax DeLuca, without whom this report wouldn't exist. Um, additional thanks to Sarah Lutman and the Eight Bridges team who were fantastic. Of course, our colleagues at the Ford Foundation. And a special thanks to uh, former Knight colleague, Chris Barr, uh, who brought this project to Knight in the first place um, and who it is, has been my privilege to, to uh, sit in his seat here on this project. And so thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jax. Thank you, Coven. Um, on behalf of the Arts Endowment, we're, we're so grateful for the support of Knight Foundation and Ford Foundation for this initiative, including uh, Salome Sega, who was the uh, technology fellow at Ford Foundation, who really helped initiate this work, and Chris Barr at the formerly of the Knight Foundation. Like my colleagues, I'd also like to acknowledge Eight Bridges Workshop and Dot Connector Studio, as well as our amazing colleagues and team members who have poured uh, countless hours into this report at the Arts Endowment. So thank you for making this research a reality. As a media arts director at the National Endowment for the Arts, it's really a dream to finally celebrate the release of this new publication. Uh, knowing that the field of the technology focused arts is a frequently under-resourced and rather opaque arts practice, uh, we really felt that the development of this initiative was essential to bring greater visibility to the many ways that artists explore technology as a creative medium. As Sunil mentioned, for the past two years, we've interviewed and convened more than 100 artists and practitioners to share the knowledge and expertise that informs this report. So if you're one of those contributors, please know that we are so grateful for the opportunity to raise visibility of your work and to share the value of your creative practice with the broader arts and cultural field. This report simply would not exist without you. Throughout today's event, if you're an artist or organization working at the intersection of arts and technology, we invite you to use the hashtag techasart and tag at NEA Arts on Instagram and Twitter to share your own work. During today's event, you're going to get a sneak preview of the report, which is now available on our website. Um, but what really makes today so special is that we have paired six extraordinary artists and practitioners in three separate conversations to illuminate aspects of the report findings and provide a deeper insight into the creative ecosystem existing at this intersection of arts and technology. After these conversations, we have four very special guests who will do a brief roundup of resources for the field. Uh, so be sure to stick around after these conversations. And I'm now, I'm, now I'm going to pass this over to our incredible and lovely event MC, Harag Vartanian, editor-in-chief and co-founder of the Brooklyn-based online news forum for the arts, Hyperallergic. Harag, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure. So Jax gave you an outline of what we'll be doing today and the three conversations we'll be having, followed by some resources, um, highlighting some resources for people who may not know. But we're going to begin with a short message from John Maida, who people in the arts and tech uh, field probably don't need an introduction to. Um, but for the, those of you who are only discovering his work, um, he's a pioneering technologist who works at the cutting edge of tech, art, and design. Um, his recent book, How to Speak Machine, Computational Thinking for the Rest of Us, looks at the laws that govern computers not only today, but imagines those in the future as well. So let's get started. Hi there, I'm John Maida, and I'm delighted to be here to really express my support for computational tools in the arts. It's a topic that I think like in the 80s, we kind of took it for granted that it might become valuable, but nobody could do it. And then when I began going deep in the 90s, I began realizing that the long history of people that came before, uh, particularly from industry, uh, artists and in residents that enabled 
what we see today as the computer animation industry, the software industry, this kind of cool video technology, even switching to like portrait mode. These kind of things wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for artists who were engaged in technology creation, not just technology using, technology creation. And access to those tools and the ability to take things apart, take software apart and understand it and make it your own is really the, the secret to originality in this really interesting digital physical convergence we're experiencing right now. And so if we don't make computational tools open and easy to modify, tinker with, a lot of bad things can happen. Um, AI can contain more biases. More algorithms can be really kind of a narrow focused on just a few types of people. Uh, not a good thing for culture, business, the world. So that's why I'm really hopeful that this new push by the National Endowment of the Arts to put computational tools front and center um, really takes off. Think about photography. Photography was chemical and mechanical. And so there were ways for artists to tinker with that formula. That is now gone in the computational era. You can't open up the thing inside here so easily, the hardware or the software. And so you can't ask like, how could it work differently? What could it say instead? And this innovation loop that connects the arts and technology would be weakened, not good for the strategy of the United States or any country for that matter. So computational tools, let's make them open. I think that if we did more of that, we'd have more innovation. Why do we need it? Because so many things don't make sense anymore. They're so complex, the problems we're facing right now. They aren't just two, three, four, five dimensional. They're like a million dimensions strong. And artists being able to crack open computational tools and find new ways to understand it for transforming industry and also transforming culture. That's, uh, that's pretty American if you, if you ask me. Um, so again, thanks for having me here to say a few words. I am in a whole different space right now. I'm in the enterprise resilience world. I am so fond of the arts and design. It's where my home and passion is tied to technology. And who would have thought that STEM to STEAM would become such a thing, huh? Let's keep steaming forward, everyone. Thanks again. Great. One of the things that I really uh, like about uh, John Maida's remarks is the fact that it, it really sort of uh, represents the multi-directional nature of these collaborations we're going to see and hear about today. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Jack Staluka to um, give us a sense of some of the report findings and uh, the themes that emerged. Jax, it's all yours. All right, let's dig in. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so um, here's just uh, the cover of the report. So we hope that you dig in by clicking uh, the link that's in the chat box and check out the full report. It's now available for download. Uh, but don't forget, outside of the report, we also have um, 10 commissioned essays that uh, complement the report. But before I give you a sneak preview of some of the elements that we go over in this publication, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this field scan project at large. So as Sunil mentioned, over the past two years, we've been uh, working to uh, collect data on how artists are using technology as a creative medium. And the purpose for that was really to educate funders and service providers and just strengthen the support infrastructure for arts and technology, hopefully by leveraging improved funding and programs and resources supporting these tech-focused arts practices. We also thought it was important to raise visibility and awareness of uh, this practice, as oftentimes it's hard uh, to understand uh, what types of technologies artists are using and how they're using it. 
So first, it would be important to let you know a little bit of how we conducted the research. Um, we have been working with a technical working group comprised of field experts to provide subject matter expertise. And we also consulted over 60 artists in roundtables that took place across the United States. And here you'll see a range of artists from filmmakers and storytellers working in virtual and augmented reality to those working in experimental audiovisual performance and also internet-based art. We focused our field scan from the perspective of artists and this really allowed us to uncover the ways that artists are actively challenging the assumptions of technology and really working with technology to explore power dynamics and build equity within their own communities through skill sharing and discourse. The topics that we cover in the report go over how artists are working with digital technology by writing code, visualizing data, and developing interactive experiences. We're also talking a bit in the report how artists are building community by developing shared open source tools, establishing online forums for knowledge exchange, and founding organizations to facilitate the creativity of others. So that will be of importance for those interested in the creative economy aspect of this report. Last but not least, the report covers how artists are critiquing the influence of technologies on daily life through projects that question pervasive practices such as data collection and surveillance and their disproportionate impact on communities of color. We identified three main opportunities of ways tech-centered artists can bring specialized expertise. And this is through connecting audiences across physical and virtual spaces which certainly became more important during this time of COVID-19. We also uh, think there are opportunities for tech-centered artists to contribute to accelerated action to address racial inequities and social injustices. And tech-centered artists can also bring specialized expertise in engaging local communities to address social issues and bridge digital divides through their arts projects. When we're talking about tech-focused arts projects and practices, we're really focusing in this report on code, computation, and data, and how those have become essential building blocks of artistic creation. We're also talking about how computation and data serve as artistic materials. And we're also looking at ways that code and data provide a lens to interpret and view the world. We also give space in the report to tool building, which was a significant artistic pursuit and a vital foundation for creators. So hopefully uh, for some of you who are tool builders, that would be nice to have a little space for people to understand your work and process in developing custom software and custom hardware. Some of the context and disciplines for tech-focused arts had three main takeaways. One of them was that there's fluidity across artistic disciplines and genres and formats. We also uh, thought that the projects and the experiences exist within and between virtual and, space, virtual and physical spaces, which can sometimes uh, make it a little bit difficult to describe and pinpoint the work. Last but not least, we give space in the report to examining the ways that traditional arts disciplines are augmented and extended and not replaced by a technology. Traditional disciplines such as dance, theater, and music were frequently areas artists were infusing with code and computation. So um, there are a lot of artists who are pioneering new forms. In the report, we give a lot of space to helping others understand how to navigate the tech-focused art space. And there are three interconnected pillars of support. That's in-person gatherings, online resources and communities and colleges and universities. Even though tech-centered artists frequently relied on internet-based resources, physical hubs and traditional in-person events such as exhibitions, presentations and festivals still played an essential role in their professional and artistic development. In the report, we list a few hundred organizations and entities that focus on uplifting tech-focused arts practices. And this is just a sample of some of the organizations listed in the report. And these are all the organizations that were uh, started by artists to fill gaps in the arts infrastructure. The report also goes over how organizations serve as entry points for underrepresented voices and technology. 
Afrotectopia, Code Liberation, and Color Coded are three examples of those organizations. We also have nine artist case studies that profiled artists working in technology. And so I'm just going to scroll through a few of the case study artists to give you a taste of who is in the report. And hopefully this is enough to get you excited to go to our website and check out the videos of these artists and also read through the report, which is over 150 pages long. And the report also um, not only captures the way artists are working with technology and looking at their ecosystem, we do provide a synopsis of artist challenges. And what we discovered was more infrastructure serving artists as needed, uh, such as technology and equipment access, artistic and professional development programs, and more opportunities to create and exhibit work at scale. Also, from the perspective of artists, there were certain challenges uh, that they faced when working within the arts and cultural sphere. And it really was a, a, um, a flag for us that more infrastructure is needed to develop organization capacity to serve artists working at that intersection of arts and technology. So that goes from um, staff expertise to developing more technological infrastructure and building out more program support and networks. In the report, we do have a whole section uh, for recommendations for both the arts and non-arts sectors. And these recommendations are also accompanied by 10 commissioned essays from arts practitioners in the field. So we hope that you also read those. And that is just scratching the surface of what's in the report. And I'm gonna pass this back over to Harag. Great, thank you, Jax. It's great. Everyone should be checking out the, the report and the link as was mentioned is in the chat for those who need. So we're going to start with the first conversation, which focuses on the theme of access and community, and specifically questions such as how do uh, tech-centered artists engage communities to address the digital divide? So the uh, we have two um, uh, participants. The first, Stephanie Dinkins, is a transmedia artist who creates platforms for dialogue about race, gender, aging, and our future historians. Dinkins' art practice employs emerging technologies, documentary practices, and social collaboration towards equity and community sovereignty. She's also going to be joined by Amelia Winger Bearskin, who is an artist who has made work with emerging technologies for the last 20 years. She is a Banks Endowed uh, preeminent chair and associate professor art of, art, of art, artificial intelligence in the arts at the University of Florida Digital Worlds Institute. So we're going to be watching some short videos, and then the conversation will be continued. I got into coding because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do by myself. And being able to collaborate with machines meant that I could do things that I do poorly faster, and then I could do things that machines do poorly uh, better. <laughs> The first place I started performing was with my mom, who was a storyteller from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I would play the Iroquois rattle and drum while she told stories. I then became a classically trained opera singer. I started composing and directing and making more and more emerging technology mixed with live performance and opera and kind of ended up in museums. Nowadays, I use a lot of different media, AR and VR or interactive media to tell stories, co-creating with other types of non-human systems. As an artist or as an activist, I look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy was built. We said that anything that I'm doing now is the result of seven generations behind me. Anything I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations ahead of me. We use stories as a way of taking values and ethics and putting them into the core of innovation. I started looking at the media landscape we have now. How do I take information and encode it for future generations? A lot of my work is really about creating an ethical framework for software development and design and articulation of values and ethics within technologies with the understanding that we need to future-proof these. 
There's a notion that the technology we've created now has outrun us. No one knows how to regulate it. We accidentally opened this Pandora's box and we can't get it all back inside. But actually, we can choose to use technology to build a more just world, a more equitable world. We can demand that. We can say that we want algorithms that are human-centered, that are for our environment, that are pro-democracy. We can articulate the values we want to see in technology and communicate those to seven generations in the future. What do we want to achieve with the culture and social network that we're creating? Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Dinkins. I'm a transmedia artist and Kusama Professor of Art at Stony Brook University. My art practice is centered on explorations of artificial intelligence and other far-reaching technologies as they intersect ideas of race, aging, gender, and our future histories. I'll start with a pivotal project called Conversations with Bina 48. In this project, I find myself interviewing a robot that mimics my identity. It left me very worried about the impact the technological future would have on Black communities and other BIPOC folks. Am I a reflection of you? I thought you were, but I wasn't completely sure. Why did you think that? I was going on a hunch. Are you a reflection of me? In some ways, I am a mirror of you. Conversations with Bina48 led to the production of my very own talking AI entity. Not the only one is my attempt at making a conversational chatbot based on three generations of women from my family. The data that informs N2 are oral histories between us. The project is teaching me a lot about how the shift to care-based, community-created data can help transform algorithmic systems. Thank you. So if we can be joined by uh, both of the speakers, Amelia and Stephanie, great. Um, so I guess I'm going to start with the first question for you, Stephanie, since your work um, certainly, I mean, I think there's a lot of commonalities in both your work. But in, your, in, in the case of your work, I'm wondering how you see some of the um, divides being bridged with art and technology in a way that art that doesn't use technology may not be able to do. And I'm wondering what are some of the advantages you're seeing in, when you are trying to create these bridges between communities and even with the future, to be frank. Wow, um, that's a big question, right? And, and it's interesting because I, I go, oh, I don't think they are being bridged in many ways, right? A lot of times for me, it's about thinking about what's coming at us and thinking about what it means to be left behind or not trying to communicate and participate in the creation of these systems that are supporting society. That seems like really detrimental um, and, and honestly deadly in a lot of ways to me, right? So my idea is to just start engaging, um, even from my own position as a person who barely claims technologist as, as a way of being in the world, but someone who is a tinkerer and a crafter. And I think most people can be tinkerers and crafters in one way or another, um, and if dedicated enough, can start to play. But also calling communities' um, attention to the idea that there are all these things happening around us that are embedding right, the ways that we interact with each other um, on many, many, many levels. Um, and so it's imperative that we understand that and I've seen that grow from 2014 to now and then think about strategies of how we deal with it is it all about refusal is it about engagement what do we think we need to do um, so that we do have footing in the future great and Amelia I'm going to ask you the same question then add in in your presentation it was really fascinating to hear about the seven generations because that is such an encompassing idea. And I'm wondering how that changes uh, your relationship to technology in general that might be different from some of your other colleagues. 
Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, I look through the world at the world of technology through an indig indigenous lens. That's absolutely correct. And thinking about seven generations, you know, when I build a website right now, and I imagine explaining it to a developer a year from now, right, I would have to kind of talk to them a lot about what what was happening when I built it, right? Uh, these were the dependencies I had, this is the kind of code, maybe the browser was like this, there was a popular way of interacting with websites. And that's why I built it in this way. Now, what about five years, 10 years, and then seven generations, right? At that point, when I'm explaining to someone, well, what were you trying to do with this web based art in seven generations from now, I actually have to start thinking about embedding what is the most important thing I wanted? Was it about this JavaScript library? Or was it actually about the value and ethics of my community and creating something for my community that could last and that and I want them to carry forward that I want them to understand the values the ethics and why I created this and what information I'm carrying forward from my ancestors as well and that way art is a really perfect way of doing that because it understands abstraction and it understands imagining something in the future and connecting it to the now and to the before absolutely Absolutely. Now, Stephanie, in, in terms of uh, one of the things that uh, impressed me greatly about your video was, you know, the, the notion of the way you use aesthetics to amplify the different messages. And, you know, and one of the things about this report that I think is really interesting is the notion of ecosystems, right, and the ecosystems of creation. So I'm wondering how perhaps the art field has perhaps failed you in a way in some ways, dealing with technology, if there are ways that you see, um, uh, you know, that could be more efficient. And I'm going to ask the same question of you, Amelia, as well. Um, oh, great question, right? Um, and it, it's really important because I've been an anomaly for a very, very long time until I got to New Inc. in, in 2014 or so, 2016. Like, you know, I've been in all these places where people did not quite understand me. It's like, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And my answer is, is usually the answer that Amelia just gave, right? Like thinking about the, the ethics and the value systems that go into a future and how I can, as myself, best communicate those to some extent. And it's super interesting to me because now, right, people are starting to understand me in a different way, but I'm also claimed by many, many different communities. So I have a slide that lists me as a AI artist, a coder, data science, um, theory, ethics, like these are journalism. Like I, I love that I've been accused of acts of journalism, right? <laughs> so all these people are kind of pulling me in in this different ways from these perspectives. So there's finally this convergence of a kind of larger interest plus the art. But you know, it's, it's, a hard, it's, it's been a hard and slow road because of the aesthetics. And really for me, what's important is the ways in which we intersect society. And so my aesthetics also shift all the time because it's about what I feel will best work at the moment, as opposed to whatever medium. And so. Great. Amelia, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I've, I've been really lucky to be in community with Stephanie for these years. And so I definitely never felt alone having you in this space with me, Stephanie. I, I just am an incredible fan of all your work and you're so inspiring. Um, I, I, you know, I, I like to joke that I've been doing the same thing, but people say that a different name for it, you know? So I, I started out as an opera singer and my work became increasingly more tech hijacked until uh, people were like, you know, I think you're a performance artist. I'm like, sure. And then later they're like transmedia artists. Fine. Okay, later, you know, an AI art, you know, I've been doing the same thing, right? I've been trying to communicate my values to future generations to be a storyteller using what I know best, which happens to be this kind of mix mash of an intersection of the arts and technology. And, it, you know, I come by it honestly or dishonestly with my mother as a as a traditional storyteller. But my father was a technologist um, and, and worked for Kodak. And both of them were always pulling me in these directions of like, here, do this on a computer, says my dad. And my mom says, you know, build that into a story and, and, and transcend the colonized view of the world. Right. And and so I don't feel like I've ever done anything different or, or had a lack of community because there have always been weirdos like myself uh, collaborating with me throughout the whole time. But it is true that there are moments of spotlight and interest and then and then it fades. And yet we are still here as a community. The, the Stephanie's and myself have been making this work our whole lives and we love it and we'll continue to do it whether the spotlight is on us or not. But we do need each of your help in making sure that that next generation of Amelia and Stephanie's have a space, have the space to play as we have had. Great answer. You're here. 
<laughs> that, 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 that was brilliant. Um, so Stephanie, in your case, in the in the that sculpture, the, uh, the that we that we saw at the end, um, that you created. Now, when you it looks like it's something that functions in a gallery space. Now, how do you decide in terms of the virtual versus the physical, and and where where do where do those um, boundaries where are they for you in terms of how is it important to have a physical relationship with these with this history or, or stories or, or these different things? And how important is it to have a virtual? I think it's really important. Like I'm starting to think of the virtual as more and more important only because I can make it openly available. So uh, the last few projects I've done are now openly available as WebXR pieces, which means that people anywhere, as long as they have access to the internet can come and partake and participate in them. And that thought is super gratifying to me, right? And, and it really comes out of an experience that I had at Recess Gallery downtown working with kids here in Brooklyn who I brought in a VR headset and they had never seen one. And this was two or three years ago, right? And I think very much about, well, how do you create something that you've never even interacted with, even if the rest of the world is a buzz with it, right? And so I try to make things as available as possible and the internet is one of those spaces that does that. Be, having things in person though, like physical embodiment um, for me is interesting too. You know, in a way I'm always trying to interject the culture that I know, mm -hmm. um, the values that I know that I hold really dear, not only as Amelia says out seven generations, but I think it's kind of rare even in the now. So I want people to have to kind of encounter and be confronted by it and I also often make things talk or tell stories. And I do that because almost anyone can talk to something, right? It removes a lot of the barrier to entry. And if you can talk to something, you can engage it. And whether it's in a gallery or in an art fair or in a general public space, I find all those conversations valuable um, for, the, for the work and for the research. Right. And Amelia, in your case, I mean, uh, when working with virtual technologies, of course, there's a divide sometimes with people in, in responding a little bit to what you said earlier, but also what Stephanie's saying, in that sometimes you have to educate the public or, or a public, I should say, in terms of using those. Now, what are some of the biggest challenges for you in terms of that? Well, I, I love that. Oh, thank you. I love the framing that Stephanie gave about, gave about access and conversations. And you know, Stephanie, I've loved your AI assembly, which is conversations that have expanded, uh, you know, throughout time and building that community. So conversations are so important, and and I think it is a building block for accessibility. Uh, I give an example. I'm doing a, a project with the United States Departments of Arts and Culture on our Native Land Initiative, and we're thinking about how do you take land acknowledgement and move it towards action. And initially, when I was brought into the project, there. Like we are, our advisory council had thought about a flow chart to give to museums to understand the, the way in which they can heal this relationship with the land and indigenous people through land acknowledgements. And what is the next step, right? And I said, well, you know, what a flow chart is, is actually an algorithm. And a really great way of interacting with an algorithm is reducing that barrier of not even having to have something that I have to understand as complex as a flow chart, but I could just have a conversation. And as, you know, Stephanie knows as well, having a conversation with an AI is one of the most fluent and fluid ways that you can interact, a chatbot, a conversational AI, and imagining that we can just, with a cell phone, um, and it doesn't have to be a smartphone, it can be M SMS that is a, the most available device on the planet, right, is an, is an SMS-based interface. The accessibility of not even needing a screen um, it, it is incredible. And, and so in that case, technology can actually be a way to enable accessibility to concepts um, that that are more difficult. Like if you say, well, this was going to be a virtual reality experience, the amount of museums that might be able to, to see it and have their entire population engage with it would be lower, right? And if your goal is to be able to have the community be involved, it's such a great um, way of connecting with their land and, and connecting with land back initiatives and honoring native land. It's important to make sure everyone's voice is included in that conversation. And so if AI can be a connector rather than something that's seen as a black box overlord, I think that's when we can see some of the very exciting spaces that technology can create um, for connection and community. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Amelia, for joining us. And we're going to continue on to the second conversation now. So in this conversation, we're focusing on value and impact. And we're talking to two arts uh, people involved in arts and social justice funding, 
Um, and they're going to be talking about um, the various things. And the video that will be uh, beginning is by Scatter, and it will address a little bit of how artists address equity in the tech field. So um, the two speakers we have is Omari Rush, um, who's the executive director of Culture Source in Detroit, and is the governor appointed chairman of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. In these roles, he advances efforts to have creative expression thrive in diverse communities. And he'll be joined um, all, uh, by Ruby Lerner, who is the founding executive director of Creative Capital, an arts foundation that adapts venture capital concepts to support individual artists. She serves on the board of directors of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and on the advisory boards of New Inc. at the New Museum and IBEAM. So let's get started. The Changing Same is a virtual reality experience where you travel through time and space to witness the connected historical experiences of racial injustice in the United States. How do you tell a story that started 400 years ago and still continues today? At Scatter, our core ethos is art propels innovation. Scatter builds software to create new ways of representing our reality with volumetric video. We use that software ourselves to make it available to creators worldwide, tell stories. Our software is DepthKit. It records volumetric video of real people and authentic gestures in three dimensions. The Changing Same is our most ambitious, bravest film to date. Filming during COVID was a challenge. Two Apple Take 7 markers. We ran a remote production via video calls. We used OBS so our actors could preview their performances live. In parallel with production, our engineers were advancing DepthKit software. We created an all new integration with Unity game engine so we could use Unity's VFX graph to create expressive digital possibilities. Lamar, artist and guide through the changing same, is made of magical with firefly effects. Oh, I can see you're curious. The virtual worlds we built in the changing same are all real sites of the historic 1934 Claude Neal lynching on which our story is based. We used photogrammetry to capture and memorialize these unmarked sites. Great, thank you. So if I can ask Omari and Ruby to join us. Great. Um, Ruby, I know uh, we've been, uh, many people probably uh, no need, no, don't need any introduction to Creative Capital, which we were a very important part of in creating. And I wonder if you wanted to start this conversation because you know one of the main questions we're talking about are the funding priorities uh, of, and tech-centered projects. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, on the general topic. Yeah, you know, I have uh, a lot of thoughts. I'm going to echo, I think, some things that have, have been said by others today. You know, so many funders are, are interested in artists whose work is, is addressing the core issues of our time. And, you know, the list is long, criminal justice and racial equity and gender equity and climate change, to name just a few. I think what we don't often think about is how many of those issues have kind of migrated into the digital realm as well. So if you look at things like predictive policing, if you look at AI that proclaims it can identify the gay face, if you look at the harassment of women in cyberspace, especially in the gaming community, broadband disparities in, in communities of color and rural areas, technology isn't neutral. And um, I think that artists, the technology artists, in the world um, have been sounding the alarm on this for years. And I think what's so exciting as, as we can see with the artists who are presenting here today is that tech artists often foreground ethics and values in their work. And as John Maida pointed out, they have the skills to reveal to us the sort of underneath, what's underneath what we actually see, what is invisible to most of us. So I think this is, just, this is the critical work that they're doing. And, and I think I'll come back to talking about, um, I think the role that, that funders who might be tech curious uh, can play now. Great. 
Omari, do you have any thoughts on the topic? Uh, yes. So one, I'll just say, yes, this is Omari speaking. Uh, just notably, I'm wearing glasses. I got brown skin, uh, plump lips, toothy smile, um, and behind me is a beige wall. I'm really happy to be here. I love Ruby Tech Curious. Uh, it just sounds a little provocative and fun. Um, so, you know, I would just say that in terms of the, you know, the opportunities and, and values here is um, this intersection of uh, you know, art and digital tech is just so exciting and and still, you know, yet to be mapped, which is why I'm fully mapped, which is why this study is so exciting. You know, I remember years ago, I was at a conference of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies and Jax DeLuca, who we all are just loving on um, for her leadership in this work, was giving a presentation on the state of digital tech and art. And I was blown away by not only how much I didn't know that she was talking about, but also the amount of things that I just had not thought to know that I needed to know, a bunch of unknown unknowns for me. And so, you know, as I think about um, folks like myself at Culture Source and the State Arts Council in Michigan, as people engage in community investment, start to broaden their awareness of the possibilities of this work, um, there are just tremendous opportunities to um, advance all kinds of um, kind of social issues, artistic issues. Um, in particular, I think about youth and you know you go into any creative youth development center and youth are on certainly they're on their you know smartphones. Um, these centers are filled with computers and recording equipment. This is where young people are at. And so you know anybody in particular that's looking to do work in arts education and creative youth development, um, exploring this intersection is um, is a really rich space. Right. So um, I, I'd love to ask both of you in terms of one of the things about funders in the arts and particularly in the tech spaces is often the uh, technology and the arts tends to percolate in some younger demographics and younger communities that don't aren't always necessarily connected to some of the people who are funding these projects. I'm wondering if there are some challenges you see and, and some challenges that have been perhaps overcome. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that because I'm sort of uh, uh, technology, I'm kind of a technology idiot. I mean, I, I just, I'm really uh, hopeless. Um, I won't tell you how recently it was that I learned how to attach a, a, a document to an email. Okay. So um, when we launched Creative Capital in, in 1999, I really felt it was critical to add a category of work for the uncategorizable, because here we are, we're dealing with contemporary artists. We know that, that their job is to take us to places that we don't, we don't know what they are. So I really wanted to make a home, especially for technology-based artists, because we were beginning to see a lot of that work kind of you know, popping up at that time in 1999. But you know, the important thing is that we did this even if we as a staff didn't fully grasp what these artists were up to, and we didn't. And guess what, that was, and it's still okay. And I think one of the barriers is that people feel it's not okay. Well, I don't understand this work, so how can we support it? But guess what, there are a lot of people who are referenced in this wonderful document that we now have, and a lot of organizations where there's tons of expertise. So we brought in great adjudicators who did understand the field. So we called it Emerging Fields. And you know, I think we did in a small way, create a home. And I think we played a small role in elevating greater awareness of, of the work that some amazing artists were doing. The very practical way that we did it, or one way that we did it, um, was we had artist retreats where we brought all our artists from all our different disciplines together. And we mixed in the artist presentations of technology artists with artists from more conventional fields. So this did two things. It, it built great relationships between and among the artists from all these different discipline areas. But because we had so many curators and, and programmers and publishers and editors in attendance, it also helped to demystify the work for them and to make it comfortable for them to approach technology artists. So that was a very practical thing that we did. I think that we helped, you know, sort of advance things. And Umari, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts and you have the, you've also had the experience of working with governmental organizations in this. So I wonder if you can add that perspective as well. Well, you know, I, I very much appreciate Ruby's uh, Ruby's kind of pioneering and visionary work at Creative Capital, um, and just an honor to be, you know, sharing a screen with you, Ruby. Um, so, um, you know, I would I would echo um, a lot of what Ruby has said, and and really kind of attach this word um, emergence, and that is that so much of this work 
has to do with um, really embracing a certain kind of messiness and complexity that not a lot of organizations, not a lot of um, philanthropists, certainly not a lot of government agencies are used to and comfortable with embracing. And so, you know, as I think about what it means to really think about what the work of <clears throat> artists and who are, you know, working in digital tech means, a lot of what, it, what I'm feeling is like, it has to do with a certain kind of comfort with experimentation, with things not going quite, quite right. And that's gonna take um, folks really just working differently, changing the way that they think about funding projects, the length of the funding um, and um, the size of it. I mean, you know, digital tech is, can be expensive. Um, and, you know, in certain situations, it costs annual costs to kind of resubscribe to an update. These are new ways, new levels of funding that I think um, will require uh, lots of different kinds of people to step up in different ways in order to really see both um, positive developments and exciting developments in the work. So um, my last question is, is on uh, recently I, I had uh, led a workshop at the Brooklyn Public Library and one of the topics that came up that I guess was a little unexpected to me and I just wanna, wanted to ask this as both people involved in funding. Um, one of the barriers that many artists saw were in the application processes and in the ways of interacting with funders and organizations. And I wonder if that's something both of you would like to address. You know, I think that um, if you're a funder, you need to be in a constant feedback loop with the people you give grants to and the people who don't get the grants to just sort of find, find out information like that. I know when I was at Creative Capital, we tried to have a very open-ended um, question, which was, tell us about your project. So that allowed people to really just talk about whatever they were doing in their own, you know, creating their own frame. Um, and we asked a few other questions about, you know, the influences on your work and, and, and things like that. So, so I think we, we tried to be, we tried to keep it as open um, as possible. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think that that's something again to the, the tech curious um, in the, in, the, in this conversation who are participating today, you know, the artists who are working in this field have really the same vision and goals that I think the funders, uh, you know, that funders do, which is a more just, a more equitable, a more open future. And so to my mind, this is, this is there's a total compatibility between the artists who are working with technology and the funders. And, we need to be making a commitment to supporting this work in a, in, in a robust way now. I think the imperative has never been greater. And if that means you have to adjust your, uh, you know, your application uh, language or process, I think we have to kind of be open to that. Spot on, Ruby. And I would, I would just say, you know, uh, one of the great bits of timing is that we're in a moment now where so many folks in philanthropy and um, again, community investment, state arts agencies are deconstructing their application processes and really reevaluating just for the sake of equity, the way that they are inviting, encouraging people to um, seek funding. And so, you know, this is just a bit of encouragement as you're doing those kinds of things, there is certainly the opportunity to think about diversifying the accessibility um, for artists as well, certainly artists working in digital tech. And one of the really exciting things about this report is, um, you know, things like the, uh, the glossary in the back that's just like breaking down very, on one hand, simple terms, but terms that are just like, you get to a point where it's like, what's the meaning of is, you know? Um, and also just a list of artists and arts organizations that have been working wonderfully and gloriously on the margins, um, who are now um, real resources and allies to folks broadly in the field. And so, um, you know, I think there is great opportunity to evolve applications um, and to evolve the expertise of those folks evaluating the um, applications and also to invite others in who, um, who are happy to, you know, engage in really meaningful and rich um, field building work. Great. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Amari, for joining us. And so My now we're, gonna, we're going to transition to our third conversation. The theme is future and integration. And the two speakers are Eleanor Savage and Rafiq Anadol. 
And they're going to be addressing some of the, uh, what can be done for systematic change in the field, as well as how we can integrate artist-driven technologies within this future world, world building. So Rafik Anadol is a media artist and director born in Istanbul, Turkey. He currently lives and works in Los Angeles and is a lecturer and visiting researcher in UCLA's Department of Design and Media Arts. Eleanor Savage is a white, butch, genderqueer, anti-racist arts advocate and organizer. Savage is currently the program director at the Jerome Foundation, which is located on the lands of the Dakota, also called Minnesota. Savage has a lifelong commitment to promoting human rights and actively works against racism and all the other intersecting oppressions. So we're gonna start with the video and then transition to the conversation. In 2018, I had a call from LA Philharmonic who was looking for an exceptional installation to help them mark the celebrated symphony's 100th year anniversary. For this, we decided to ask the question, can a building learn, can it dream? And to answer this question, we decided to collect everything recorded in the archives of the LA Phil and WCH, to be precise, 77 terabyte of archive memories. By using machine learning algorithms, the entire archive, going back to 100 years, became projections on the building skin. We used total 42 projectors to achieve this futuristic public experience in the heart of Los Angeles, getting one step closer to the LA of Blade Runner. And if ever a building could dream, I think it was in this moment. Research in artificial intelligence is growing every day, leaving us with the feeling of being plugged into a system that is bigger and more knowledgeable than ourselves. In our studio, we are constantly updating our tools and imagination and our knowledge to find a way to utilize artificial intelligence to touch as many humans as possible through art, through scientific collaboration, and through medical research. We believe that it is in our hands, humans, to train artificial minds to learn and remember what we can only dream of. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So if we can be joined by both the speakers, Rafik and uh, Eleanor, great. So um, Rafik, in some of the conversations around this piece, one of the things that really impressed me that I wanted to ask about was the fact that your project at the LA Philharmonic um, also pushed the organization to develop their own technological resources. Can you tell a little bit about that? Because people often think of these as one-way conversations. And in projects like this, it demonstrates how this really is a multifaceted conversation and multi-directional. Thank you, Hurak. Definitely. I think this project was, first of all, a truly dream project, almost 2012, when I moved to Los Angeles to start this beautiful journey in this beautiful country. And then what happened was, honestly, to ask the institution, how can we achieve such a, like, a groundbreaking idea in the form of public art? By the way, I think public art is one of the most fundamentally important art form that is for anyone, any age, and any background. But the institution was also very ready for LA Philharmonic to really embark their journey to the next 100 years. But the challenge was here, how we can access 100 years of digital archives of an institution in the age of mission intelligence. So as a team, as an artist and a group of people in the studio, we even help the organization to even like re remember the tools right now we may use even for the next century. Um, and while doing that, I think the institution completely enjoy the collaboration and enhancing the tools, but also new ways of looking the future. Um, and I think here through art, technology and science collaboration happen, and especially remembering technique in the age of AI, especially in the form of Frank Gehry's beautiful building, that was, I think, a very poetic and a meaningful public art experience. Right. And Eleanor, in your case, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the general, um, how, how this type of systematic change can happen and how we can integrate technology and, and look towards the future. Yeah, I think uh, some of my fellow panelists have already talked about this. Uh, we need to you know, rely on the artist as the navigators for this journey. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, thank you, uh, Rafiq and Stephanie and Amelia for sharing your work over the, the course of the conversation today. Uh, you know, the work that is being done is, is so expansive and uh, deep and 
is you know, exploring all of these things that right now in this moment in time, we so desperately want to figure out equity, uh, community power, non-hierarchical non community power, um, values-based tools and systems and practices that are rooted in justice and consent and accessibility. And the artists working at these intersections are doing just that. And so, you know, building those relationships and what, that's what's so wonderful about this study is you've got a, in your hands now, you have a map to this community and to these artists and you can find find them and you know it, the this report creates that access and our our job i think as funders is to get out of the get out of our own way get out of the artist way and get behind them and support the work great so Rafik, I want to ask you a little bit about skills, because I think people often talk about artist skills, other skills, but I think there's also skills for audiences, there's skills for or organizers, funders, and I'm wondering what you think, and Eleanor, I'm going to be asking you the same question, I'm wondering what you think are some of the crucial skills that need to be learned or are being learned. I think it's a wonderful question, but I would like to start answering by appreciating because I think appreciation is one of the most powerful part of remembering. And I want to appreciate my journey starting this beautiful country 2012 at UCLA and design media arts because I'm on the shoulders of many giants such as Casey Rias, Christian Moller, Jennifer Steinkamp, Rebecca Mendes. I learned from, I think, my mentors and heroes and teachers that was one of the most fundamental learning to learn, I guess a very core um, understanding. And secondly, I had three really inspiring experiments, experience happen. 2013 as a student, well, as an immigrant, and like, nobody would like to like immediately support an idea in the world, but at Microsoft Research as a student on the stage with my wife, <laughs> like a short on me, like I was trying to say, can a building learn, can a dream? And it was my first funding experience. But what I learned there is actually if the idea, a, a dream, a context of or discourse of art is actually very appreciated if it's well presented. And the second experience was I was um, planning to become another egocentric art experience, but a, a team, a team that can become an, an organic machine has a is kind of a sensitive to humanity. And now we are 14 people can speak 14 language and represent 10 countries in Los Angeles. So diversity and inclusive team as one of the most fundamental part. And also like as, an, as a media artist, I was trying to learn how to work with AI and I was kind of alone for a while, but I had an experience with Google Artists and Machine Intelligence um, support program where me and my team learned how to use AI in, in our artistic practice, which applied to a library of the future concept. So these were, I think, a wonderful journey and, and fantastic supports happen over the years that I was not even aware while in the beginning. So I deeply appreciate these checkpoints and even the Disney Hall project had a similar uh, support came from the Google Arts and Culture, which allows us to, you know, connect a, a private and a nonprofit and an art studio to generate a new ways of imagining future. Absolutely. I, I love appreciation being at the center of that. I like that. Eleanor, any thoughts? Yes, I would say uh, be willing to step into the unknown. Uh, because this is a, a sphere that is constantly changing and expanding and diving in and you know uh creating new expressions and connections and networks and so uh if you're afraid of technology if you're resistant and biased toward technology that's a big roadblock you know you have to be willing to just go for it um and you know in 1995 i was working at the walker art center and shuli chang uh, was doing a, a, a work called Bowling Alley. And I think at the time there were probably five people with computers at the Walker. Uh, so um, she wanted to connect, uh, you know, have an internet connection basically between this bowling alley and the Walker Art Center. And there were no, you know, lines, there was no fiber optic cables, there was none of that at that time. So, um, you know, myself and my staff had to yeah, go, okay, well, let's figure this out. <laughs> and, and Shuli had the relationship with Bell Labs to say, hey, we need this, you know, whatever this little black box is, that's going to really make this work once we get the lines run. So that's the kind of, you know, going out on a, uh, you know, openly saying, I don't know, 
let's figure it out. I think that's the, that's the kind of energy that you need uh, to meet these artists where they are. Right. So now this is the final question for both of you. Uh, Rafiq, you know, often what you do brings up, it's sort of, it's a, it's a visionary idea of like making something real that was just an idea in your head. So the type of world building you do, how do you bring organizations along and publics along with you in that journey? Because it, it can often be very difficult for people to imagine what it is that they're going to be engaging with. So it's a, it's a very wonderful question, Herc. I think literally, first of all, I think art for me is humanity's capacity of imagination. And I think as artists, we have the responsibility of pushing the border at boundaries of imagination. And when the institutions and the artists and collect, uh, creators' minds connected in the same edge of imagination, and when we find the edge of technology and meaning and discourse and context, that I think very naturally happens. And also what was really powerful in my experiences when the idea itself is not only egocentric journey, but something has a collective memory, collective dream, and has a collective conscious context, the idea really reaches out beyond the certain aspects of art and reaches more than ever. And I think institutions so far that I have been working with truly enjoy that outreaching, going boundaries of certain imagination and reach as much as communities and people. That's what I found. And also when an artist and, or a creator, creative mind and an institution comes together, if the values connect and if they can openly imagine and discuss, and I think success in this context is making dream to real. And if the process openly shared, I think that's a very natural success there. Great. Eleanor, any thoughts? I can't do any better than what Rafiq just said. It's about expanding, uh, expanding the, our minds, our dreams, our hearts. And that's exactly what these artists are doing. Fantastic. Thank you to the both of you for, for joining us for this conversation. And we're going to transition now. We're going to be talking, uh, doing some uh, resource, talking about resources um, that, will, that will be discussed. The first one uh, will be introduced by Golan Levin. And it's called Art and Code. So um, Golan, I'm wondering if you could take it away. Hi, and uh, thank you so much. Um, it's a really immense privilege to be here. Um, I want to congratulate Jax and her team, uh, the Bridges, a Bridges Workshop and the Dot Connector Studio on what is really a spectacularly amazing uh, report. Um, it's a privilege to have you know, played even a tiny part as an advisor to it. And I want to say, and it's a little difficult to say as a, as a white dude, but I feel seen. And, and what I mean by that very precisely is that um, for a long time, I think tech arts were overlooked or, or um, kind of ignored. Uh, they're, they're not this, they're not that. And, um, uh, you know, uh, computer art has existed for as long as the NEA since the, you know, it's older than acrylic paint. Uh, it's from 19, you know, the early to mid 1960s. But to finally have this report that articulates um, what are, uh, the sort of the needs of this community that I, I feel like I, I participated in and represent is, is just absolutely amazing. So what I wanted to do just in, the, in a minute or two here was to kind of show what support looks like by giving some personal examples from my own laboratory. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to share. Can you all see my screen here? Uh, if I do this, it's good. Can you see that? Great. Okay, excellent. So these are just some 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 actually NEA supported open source arts initiatives from my laboratory at Carnegie Mellon. I direct something called the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, which is a, a laboratory that supports atypical and anti-disciplinary uh, research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. And one of the um, things that we've been particularly involved with for some time has been the support of open source software toolkits for the arts or ASTA. And um, these are tools that are made for artists by artists uh, in order to uh, democratize access to using computing and data uh, and make information arts and interactive software. Um, and um, we've been supporting a number of these at the studio. And for example, uh, through uh, contributors, conferences, sprints, and residencies. This is, for example, a, a residency uh, that we hosted uh, twice in 2015 and 2019 of the P5JS community. And basically, we you know, gather people together, in this case with support of the NEA, to us uh, to allow um, these developers and contributors to create documentation, to create, you know, 
bug fixes to, you know, to, to, to realize what their mission statement is. Um, gathering people together like this when the people who contribute to these environments are distributed across the world is really um, a special and rare privilege uh, to have. And it, you know, the thing that I wanna say about these open source software toolkits for the arts is that every dollar into them goes back out to the public a thousand fold because the, although the communities that produce these toolkits are very small, you know, 15, 20 people or so, they're used by thousands or or even hundreds of thousands of people in the United States and around the world. Um, we had another residency more recently where we, we hosted a group of uh, remote artists and residents. Uh, all these are artists who are working on tools. And one of the outcomes of this was a, a great resource that's mentioned in the report uh, by Everest Pipkin called the Open Source Experimental and Tiny Tools Roundup. It's a list of more than 850 open source tools for the arts um, made, again, by artists and for artists. Um, also, uh, with the support of Knight Foundation and NEA, we uh, convened a group of people who are developers of open source software toolkits for the arts. And we have this report on our GitHub, also mentioned in the report, uh, sort of thinking specifically about the needs of this community as, as a resource that I wanted to, to mention. Um, we've run conferences or festivals such as Art and Code, uh, which is uh, a way of gathering people together to democratize access to sort of topical new media. When the Kinect sensor came out from Microsoft in 2011, for example, we had a conference all about 3D sensing and visualization. In 2016, we focused on augmented reality and virtual reality. This January, with support from the NEA, we focused on crafting and homemade uh, types of approaches to technologies. Um, and finally, just uh, not a shameless plug, but actually uh, kind of a mention of exactly how the, the NEA sort of worked. They supported a recent book that I wrote with Tiga Brain, uh, which is an educator's guide. It's the first time that we've uh, compiled um, sort of assignments that are sort of canonically given to new media artists and designers around the world uh, in a recent book published by MIT Press. Um, I want to give shout outs to these great organizations, centers, and, and resource centers. Uh, the Clinic for Open Source Arts in particular uh, at, uh, at, UC, at, at Denver is uh, supporting open source arts. And uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to thank you so much for, for the, the opportunity. Thank you so much for that. So the second presentation we're going to have is about Immerse, uh, which is a, also calls itself Creative Discussion of Emerging Nonfiction. The publication and uh, I want to invite Sarah Wallison to uh, talk a little bit about that. Hello and thanks for having me here. It's a real honor to be with this group and an incredibly inspiring uh, and fantastic conversation and also congratulations to Jax and the whole team for this really important report. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Immerse and let me share my screen. Um, let's see. Um, can you see it? Yes, great. So um, yes, Immerse is a medium publication that fosters dialogue and provides information on nonfiction uh, immersive storytelling. Um, we have a team, uh, an editorial collective with Jessica Lark, who's also the publisher, and Ingrid Kopp, who's also a producer, Abby Sun, who's um, the main editor now, Kat Cizek, uh, Carrie McLaren, Nagosi Nwadi Gabu, and Claudia Romano. Um, why are we here? We're a community. Um, it's a place to ask questions, have conversations about these rising forms, how they work, what they mean, and how makers are innovating. And we really care about access and opening this field to anyone. We, you know, anyone with an internet access can access this um, publication. And we're always looking for different writers. And we're also really focused on, on bringing BIPOC writers and artists um, to write and to feature. We want to spark conversation. Um, immerse writers, they examine the art and craft of emerging nonfiction media, um, impact, the implications, um, evaluation, aesthetics, audiences, and social change. How are people using these um, 
technologies and creating media for social change. Uh, we're co-produced by MIT Open Documentary Lab, where I'm the uh, director and the Dot Connector Studio. We're founded in 2016 um, with a grant from the Pledging Fund and now are funded by Ford and MacArthur and NEA. Uh, we're interdisciplinary and we serve as a bridge between uh, academia and practitioners. That's very important. We have scholars who write and we also really give space for practitioners to reflect on their practice and write about it and share what they're thinking and be in dialogue with each other. We have a website and a newsletter um, produced by Ingrid Kopp. It um, highlights projects, um, shares articles that we're reading, uh, funding uh, events, upcoming events. Uh, it comes out monthly. Uh, we also um, publish research. So our collective wisdom report, which was created by the co-creation studio at our lab, the MIT Open Documentary Lab, uh, we published um, a lot of sections from that field study um, at the at Immerse, as well as Making a New Reality, which is a toolkit that shares resources for professionals who want to create more inclusive media futures. Um, that's it. That's a short, uh, I was asked to give a short description. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach us at editor at immerse.news. And we're always looking for writers. So please pitch stories to us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Sarah. Wonderful. So now our final um, of many resource shout out is going to Processing Foundation, which makes software tools available for free. Um, that support the use of code for self-expression. And the speakers um, uh, will be uh, Saber Khan and I believe Dorothy Santos uh, will also be joining in. Hello, it's so nice. To, it's nice to see you, Rog. <laughs> um, yes, my name is Dorothy Santos. I'm the executive director for Processing Foundation. And this is such a great time. It's great timing speaking with you all because we just announced our 2021 fellows. Uh, we have an annual fellowship program that is generously supported by the National Endowment for the Arts. And um, as you can see, Sabra is showing some of our fellows here. And you can visit us at processingfoundation.org. And another thing that you can learn a little bit more about what our fellows are doing is through our the, the past work, obviously, um, through our medium publication. So that's another place that I would love to invite everyone on the call to actually take a look at because you can learn about the work we've been doing for since the inception of the uh, fellowship program. And so our fellows this year are working from everything between leading a P5.js workshops um, virtually in the Philippines and um, even creating a digital witch coven uh, via P5.js. And we also have teaching fellows as well, which is a part of our robust public programming through Creative Code Fest, Processing Community Day, et cetera. And we also do advocacy work by partnering with organizations such as Logic Magazine and um, you know, creating class uh, code to colonize with, um, you know, uh, artists, uh, Shin Shin and Shane McLean Holloway is another example of what we're doing out in the field, so to speak, and within and in partnership with educational institutions. And Sauber is our education community director and can actually speak to the Creative Code Fest and some of the programming that we have uh, specific to education. Yeah, thanks, Dorothy. Hi, everyone. Um, Sauber Khan. I'm a teacher in New York. Uh, my day job is a, is a K-12 teacher in New York, and I also work as an education director at Processing Foundation. And uh, while the work processing done is definitely, you know, with a lot of educators, recently we've invested in K-12 education uh, quite a bit more. Um, because our tools are open source and free, uh, they work really well in this sort of growing computer science that's happening in K-12. And uh, I, we think we have a very important message and set of tools that sort of highlight art, code, and diversity. Um, and we have a very community-focused uh, outlook. So if we feel like we're very important in that conversation, and we do a bunch of things along those lines, we have events that Dorothy mentioned, they're in person, and then we've sort of taken them virtual. We also highlight educators in our community, since so many are educators already, both K-12 and uh, beyond, and sort of talk about their practice, and they share their materials uh, freely with the wider community. So. Uh, 
you know, we really appreciate being able to do this work. And if this work is of interest to you, please, you know, get in touch. Uh, but Dorothy, you want to continue? Yes, and oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I did not actually describe. I am a brown skin Filipina human being based out in San Francisco Bay Area. I am wearing a blue top. I'm wearing clear glasses. I have short hair. And also behind me is uh, Carl the Fog, which is a, a you know, um, local you know, natural celebrity. Uh, but something else I wanted to mention was the 20th anniversary of processing. Processing is 20 years old. So, you know, it's, um, and I just feel like we're getting started. And I have told Sabra that I am all for inviting anyone who wants to make a cake, whether digital or real, to make one and send it our way. We'll be more than happy to receive it. Um, and, or even to wish us a happy birthday. That would be great. Uh, Sabra, is there anything else that I'm missing? I feel that there are other, we could talk on and on, but for me, that's, that's what I have left. Um, yeah, no, that was really great. It was really great to be here as a K-12 teacher. I don't really get to hang out and hear these types of conversations. So it's like the first week that school's been out. So I really appreciate having the time to join and see this conversation. Yeah. I'll put our, our link in the chat. Our link is in the, will be in the chat. Thank you, Sabra. And also something else I saw really quickly in the Q&A, um, accessibility and inclusion is a huge, huge area for us at Processing. So we are looking at, you know, um, you know, uh, screen readers and, uh, you know, uh, technology, working with artists on building out and expanding upon technologies for low vision and blind users. And, you know, um, it's a really big uh, you know, area that we're committed to. So I just wanted to address that because that came up actually in the chat. So, you know, please contact us and we're more than happy to, you know, um, work with the community and get more ideas. And thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you all. Great, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Saber. Greatly appreciate it. So we're going to conclude. I'm going to pass this along to Jack Staluka, and many people have already sung her praise. And I'll just add um, <laughs> that this couldn't have happened uh, without without her, of course. And she's been a delight to work with. So, Jax, it's all yours. Thanks, Harag. Um, honestly, you've done such an amazing job emceeing, and um, it's just been so exciting to hear. Um, all, all of this amazing work that all of the presenters are knee deep in. Um, and before we close up, we do want to share one last resource and that would be helpful for any prospective applicant to the arts endowment. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen um, and just give you a brief overview of our funding priorities in the media arts discipline. And for us, the priorities are really to include support for traditional and expanded forms of storytelling and visual expression, and also performance that uses film, cinema, audio, broadcast, new media, creative code, and any other related formats at the intersection of arts and technology. Our funding priorities are really focused on two areas. That would be artistic and professional development opportunities. So that's anything that's in advancing careers for artists and practitioners exploring traditional or expanded forms. Uh, and again, we're really uplifting this priority to include the intersection of arts and technology. And uh, another area is um, projects that are providing opportunities for the public to experience work. And so this also includes virtual, augmented, and any other forms of mixed realities or internet-based arts. Uh, so for any of you who have, who have incubator programs, accelerator programs, workshop series, artist commission programs, festivals, conferences, we really would uh, encourage you to come into our media arts portfolio for the Grants for Arts projects. Uh, if you want more information about that, we will send you an e-care package of resources to get you started. Here's our contact information on here, and we really hope that you reach out to us, and we're really hoping that um, we get a range of first-time applicants uh, sending uh, their sending emails our way. So um, again, thank you so much for joining us to celebrate the release of this report. Um, it's been so exciting to, to work with all of these artists, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we hope you enjoy the report.